Okay. Okay, so uh, I, I'm using this um, uh, OWL, uh, it's called this uh, uh, camera that allows you to see the students. So um, it's a little more entertaining than the typical Zoom uh, cameras, which uh, are just laptop to laptop. And um, I've been attempting to explain um, how deeply you've influenced me and um, how, uh, uh, in general, my education would uh, indicate this architectural uh, uh, desire, architectural teacher desire to uh, uh, misread philosophers and, <laughs> and, and other sciences to uh, gain influence and to inspire us to create our our work in various ways. And I think that I think I, when I spoke to you at Golden Gate Park. <laughs> Uh, a few weeks ago, yes. Um, this uh, this idea of misreading, I think, is in the architectural profession profession from the time of Aristotle. So it's uh, an ongoing problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm an extension of that. And uh, I guess a few other things quickly is that I um, I think I mentioned to you that I was uh, introduced to your your uh, wonderful thinking and your books through uh, Lex Friedman initially um, through okay. some of those podcasts, and then I just followed you down the, the podcast rabbit hole. Um, and I just noticed that everyone I was interested in, you were involved in speaking to, and I got to know you better and better. And so I, I'm uh, I'm so thrilled to have you today, uh, have you speak to the class today. And we uh, certainly have a number of students who've been uh, reading your work and are, are interested in asking a few questions, but um, I wanted to let you uh, speak uh, to the to the extent that you've thought about um, your work in relation to architectural vi visual visual literacy etc very very good and of course uh, if, if students have lots of questions I'm happy to just cut whatever I've got going here and, and answer questions so I oh, know I would so prefer you you're hearing you first it's up it's completely up to you but okay well can I let's see if I can share my screen. Yeah, maybe uh, yeah, let's... yeah I'll, I've got some slides to show then. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I just hit that button. Okay. Great. Does that appear? Architecture, virtual reality, yes. Very, very good. So I thought I would just begin with a, a few interesting um, illusions and visual effects. Um, the, the point of these visual illusions and, and is to discuss the nature of seeing. And what, what is it that we see when we look at the world around us and when we look at architecture? Um, most of us think that we're seeing reality as it is. And I want to show that um, vision works in a very different way. So here I'm going to show you uh, an, an image, a blank screen, and then the same image, but with a little change, and see if you can find the change. So that image and that image. What is the difference between those two images? Yeah. It might take you a while. You probably don't see it at, at first. Oh, now I see it, yeah. Okay, so the there's left. a boat right in the middle that appears and disappears. Okay, so, but notice that it may have taken you a long time to notice that that fairly substantial change right in the middle of the screen. So there's a, a substantial change right in the middle of the screen and you didn't notice it. So right there, it, it all one thing that this tells us is that we think that we're seeing the world in fine detail. And, and in fact, you only have fine detail in about one degree of visual angle. So if you hold your thumb out at arm's length, that the width of that thumb is about all the, the area of, of vision in which you have fine detail. And <clears throat> so what, and we have the illusion that we're seeing most of the world in fine detail and, and we're not. We're seeing a tiny, tiny fraction, one or two degrees of visual angle is all we're seeing. And if, if you don't attend to a certain part of the image, you won't get that part of the image in, in fine detail. And, and this is a, a evidence of that. You don't even notice that the boat is missing until you actually look at that area and, and put it in the area of fine detail. So this is called 
change blindness. And it really indicates that we have, most of us have a deep misconception about how vision works. We think we're seeing the world in great detail and we're not. We're seeing only a tiny bit and the rest of it's in very, very low resolution. And um, so then already our senses are deceiving us in a way. I've got a, so that was the vote, okay. Um, here's another one, give you another chance. But notice how long you might be looking. You haven't noticed it yet. You're you're looking and looking and can't see what the thing is. Um, so one, once again, you're you think that you're seeing the whole image, and and yet you're missing a lot. Do you, do you see what's missing now? Other than it going gray, is that? <laughs> uh, I don't immediately see it. Well, it's, oh, yeah, it's, I do. Yes, yeah. something major. <laughs> something yeah. major, right? Right. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to leave home without this. <clears throat> so there's the engine. Notice the engine appears and disappears. All right. So so this is not a, again a minor thing, and it's actually an important thing, and it's right there in the middle of the screen, and yet it takes us forever to to recognize it. So this is this is very interesting when we look at anything, including architecture. We don't take in the whole thing in great detail. We only take in little bits at a time. So that's that's an important aspect of vision that's not, not generally well known. One more example. This one might be easier, although it took me a long time. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. But notice that you didn't catch it right away. It takes, it takes a little bit yeah. to, to catch. There's a bar right in the middle of the screen that goes up and down. So, so once again, it, so it wasn't just one little example, all three examples probably catch you um, over a, a while. So when people look at architecture, they're not seeing your entire architectural design at once. They're seeing little bits and pieces at a time. Um, and so that's, that's one thing to, to keep in mind as we, as we discuss uh, architecture and, and visual perception. Uh, now, another, so, so that's one, one misconception that we commonly have is that we see all of the world in fine detail in a single glance. <clears throat> no, we don't. You see one or two degrees of visual angle in fine detail and the rest is pretty low resolution and um, major changes can happen and, and you won't even notice. <clears throat> Another thing that we tend to think is that when we look around, we see the world as it is. We see the true colors of objects. We see the true shapes of objects. We see what's there um, and what would be there even if no one was looking. But let's look, question that with the case of color. So here I've got a hat that I've put lots of different colors on. And um, take a look at these two colors. Are they the same color or different? Well, one looks like a, a dark brown and the other one looks like a, a, a dirty yellow or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this bar, bar and, and using uh, you know keynote procedures, just move the bar up in keynote. So I'm not gonna be changing that bar at all. I'm just gonna move it up. As you move it up, you'll see that in fact, those two rectangles have exactly the same RGB values. The red, green, blue values of those are exactly the same but your visual system is creating different colors. So the same RGB values um, in the monitor lead you to very, very different color experiences. So, so some people might think, well, when you experience a color, you're experiencing a true property of the surface of the object that you're looking at. And no, you're, you're, you're actually experiencing what your visual system decides to create. And in this case, what, what's going on here, if you look at that hat, I've given, I've cast a shadow. You can see that there looks like there's a shadow cast on it. And of course, there is no real shadow. This is just an RGB image. But you, your visual system interprets that there's a shadow uh, near the front of the image. And so it's, it's making a, an assumption that the one um, square the uh, one yeah the one one rectangle uh, that's in the light um 
is is a dark brown, but the one that's in the um, front of these of the hat, um, which is in the shadow, it's giving you exactly the same RGB values as the one that was on the side. So for it to do that and to be in the dark, it must be a brighter patch. So what you're doing is you're actually hallucinating the brightness to make up for your hallucination of the shadow. So you're hallucinating a shadow, and then you're to to make a consistent story, you're hallucinating um, the a brighter um, color to the to the um, rectangle there. So so we don't see the true say reflectance properties of surfaces. We see what our algorithms in our our heads, our visual systems are creating for the colors that we see. Same thing, by the way, for um, the shadings uh, that we see, the the shadows, and even the three dimensional surfaces that we see. Here you see a three dimensional hat, but in fact the screen is flat. So you're hallucinating the 3D hat. So the whole thing is a hallucination of 3D shapes, um, the shadows, and then the surface colors are all hallucinated um, by the visual system. And none of none of what you're seeing is in fact true. It's all what you're, you're confabulating. So color, in terms of visual neuroscience, um, the neural correlates of color perception are in the lingual and fusiform gyrus areas of the brain. Here's a picture of uh, the uh, cortex and those areas of the brain that are that are correlated with our color experiences. Um, and it turns out that you know when you're looking at something and experiencing color, there's activation in those those areas, the lingual and fusiform gyrus. Um, but there are some people uh, that have a stroke that can take out this area, say in the left hemisphere. And for someone who has a stroke, that takes out the, these color areas on the left hemisphere of the brain, what they experience is a very different color world than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. uh, they experience um, what I'm showing here. This is a, uh, you know, on the left, you see a you know nicely colored ocean scene and, and mountains and trees. On the right is just shades of gray. And that's what they experience. Everything to the left of where they're fixating is colored. And everything to the right of wherever they're fixating looks black and white, shades of gray. This is called uh, hemiachromatopsia. So this is a clinical condition, and it's you know it's, it happens um, more than once. So there are many patients that have had hemi, various kinds of hemiachromatopsia. And so here we have a, a, a nice clean neural correlate of color experiences. Um, If you stimulate these, if you stimulate the, so I, I, I mentioned, um, you know, the areas, lingual and fusiform gyrus areas are, are, are involved in color perception. If you, so if you have damage to them, you can lose color experience, but if you stimulate them, you can actually have um, false color experiences like color phosphines, almost like you're taking some weird psychoactive drug. So. So the, the colors that you experience, again, are correlated with activation, even, even weird activation of the lingual and fusiform gyrus. Here's another example um, of how we construct what we see. Um, it's called neon color spreading. You might see a bunch of concentric circles, four sets of concentric circles. And in front of them, there might be, do you, do you see sort of like a transparent rectangle, a bluish transparent rect rectangle? Well, there's, there's no rectangle. All I've done is change the color of, the, of a quarter of the arc of each circle. That's it. Your visual system um, then hallucinates the boundaries and the, um, the faint blue color throughout that whole rectangle. So you're you're this is called, it's called neon color spreading, um, and but this by the way I should say this is not my invention. Uh, I'm giving you an example that I came up with, but this was has been just uh, researched by many um, other investigators prior to me. Um, in fact, everything that I've told you so far has been done by other investigators. So I'm taking no credit for any of this. I'm just I'm just talking about it. Okay, so no credit to Hoffman here. <laughs> Uh, th this is the one example. This is something I did invent, but the, all the other stuff I did not. Um, here, uh, you might see some glowing 
light blue bars that are moving to the right. And they have pretty well-defined edges to them. Uh, well, in this image, literally nothing is moving. There are no bars and there's no 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 glowing um, at no glowing surfaces. All I've done is I've got this static array of dots and I'm just literally changing some dots from brown to blue or black to blue and blue to black. That's all I'm doing. But your but your visual system then creates an interpretation. It says, oh, well, why are these dots changing color in such a systematic way? Well, it must be because there's some kind of trans translucent or transparent um, lightly colored blue bars that are going in front of the gray dots or the black dots. And so that's what you see. So you're you're inventing. So vision is always inventing an interpretation. It's it's constructing its best hypothesis. Um, a friend of mine, Jan Kunderink, a, a brilliant psychophysicist and, and mathematician, uh, and, and vision scientist and physicist. <laughs> uh, he's he's ar arguably the, the the strongest vision scientist alive today. Um, he has this wonderful example. Um, on the right, you see a bunch of um, squares that are of different colors. Um, but when you take those same squares and rearrange them uh, as on the left, notice that, that your experience of the colors in each square is very, very different. Um, now you see, see on the right, each square looks like one solid color, it, no change. On the left, each square looks a little bit darker on the left and a little bit lighter on the right side, if you take a look at them. So they, they look almost like they're shaded. And also they look like they're scalloped, like either slightly dented or slightly um, mm -hmm. convex. Um, but these are, there's nothing different inside any square. They're exactly the same squares as on the right. I've just, what, what Kundrink did was just rearrange them. And so once again, you see the visual system um, is making an interpretation of, um, on the left, it's, it's, interpreting that there are colored light sources that like there's a, a sort of a yellowish greenish light from the bottom sort of a, a different color light from the so left side and the right side and the top and so with that interpretation then it's it's creating its own three-dimensional perceptions of, of that thing on the right you're making an interpretation that there's a single perhaps achromatic light source that's illuminating the whole thing uh, evenly so so once again our perceptions of color are not as as some people have thought that we're just veridically or correctly perceiving the the reflectance properties of surfaces. Now, some philosophers have said that, for example, trying to give a realist interpretation of our color experiences that our our experience of color is a veridical representation in the normal case of the reflectance properties of of surfaces. And what these this example shows is that that's false. Our, our colors are, are an invention um, that that it is loosely, if at all, related to the actual reflectance properties of the surfaces. Um, another example that's, uh, I believe, um, due to my friend V.S. Ramachandran, uh, professor at UC San Diego, what you might see here are um, one bump in five dents effectively right one there looks like something's bumping out and then there's five um hollows in this thing and what we seem to do is assume that the light source is overhead so we're, we're making the assumption that we're seeing objects that are lit from above as opposed from below and so if they're lit from above then the the middle one at the top would be convex and the others would be concave and if we just turn that thing upside down. So I just, right now all of a sudden you see five convex bumps and, and one concave. Okay, so so we, we again, this image is completely flat. So any 3D that you see is an illusion. You're hallucinating the 3D, but you're hallucinating it and you're hallucinating a light source direction. Um, and then you're, uh, making them consistent so that the thing is convex um, in or or concave appropriately. So we construct as few light sources as possible, and we put the light sources overhead. But this is again just this isn't the truth. This is just what we do. 
Now, we, we can argue for it, say, on evolutionary grounds to say, well, for much of our evolution, um, um, we lived in an environment where there was a single main light source, namely the sun, and it was most of the time overhead. So so one can argue for it on evolutionary grounds, but but that's, again, just something that's built into us. It's not the truth. And we like to, by the way, we also like to create convex objects rather than concave where, where possible. Um, here's something called White's illusion. The two vertical bars, you might see a sort of a, a darker gray bar on the left behind the horizontal black bars. Then you might see a um, lighter gray bar on the right that looks to be in front of the um, black bars. In fact, the grays of those two vertical bars are exactly the same. This is called white solution. So the dark gray and the light gray are in fact exactly the same shade of gray. But you, but you again um, hallucinate even just the shade of gray. So it's not just color that we hallucinate, but even the shades of gray that we hallucinate. And, and by the way, if, you know, if you're interested in these kinds of illusions and a, a, a little bit deeper explanation of what's going on here, I, my book, Visual Intelligence, um, how we create what we see is has all of, has most of these kinds of examples in it, and I go into much more detail in my visual intelligence book about these. Um, here you might see on the left it looks like some white moons with on a on a sky. And on the right side, you might see sort of dark moons with a cloudy sky. In fact, the shades of gray of each moon is identical to the one on the other side. So the top left moon on the left is exactly the same shades of gray as the top left moon on, on the right side. Each one is, is exactly the same. The images are pixel for pixel identical. But it's in the context of the surround that we interpret um, the one set of pixels as a as a white moon with with dark clouds, and on the other side, we interpret each um, circular area as a black moon with um, with lighter clouds around it. And here I've taken off the surround crudely using Photoshop or something. I just took off, took the surround away, and you can see that it, as best as I could do it in Photoshop, you can see that they're exactly the same. So here's what they look like with the surrounds and then when you take the surround away you you see that they're exactly pixel for pixel identical so once again we're not seeing the truth we're seeing what we perceive um, by construction and this little example um uh, by dan kirsten and his collaborators you might see that ball it looks like it just went up and then down now now it looks like it's going to go just along the chessboard so here it looks like it's going along the chessboard now it looks like it's going up, away from the chessboard. But if you pay close attention, you'll see that the ball, in both cases, it takes exactly the same path. So that path of the green ball is exactly the same as that path of the green ball. So the paths of the green ball are exactly the same. The only thing that is changed is the direction of the movement of the shadow that we've put. So now the shadow is underneath the ball, and now the shadow moves away from the ball, and so what you do is you interpret it as having moved up in 3D. So, so once again, we're not seeing the truth. We're, we're just seeing um, what, what interpretations we want to make. So th this is my friend, Dan Kirsten, who and his collaborators that came up with this. Oh yeah, and, and David Mill and, and, and Massian as well. Um, here's another fun example. Uh, here you see just a bunch of dots, but if I start to move them back and forth, you then you might see a three-dimensional shape. Uh, it, it's it's a, like a, a cylinder with with dots on the cylinder, and this is called structure from motion. Here, of course, the movement of the dots is only in two dimensions. All the dots are only moving in a flat plane, but you hallucinate. A, a three-dimensional structure. You hallucinate the depth. And we um, we can actually write down mathematical equations that 
pretty accurately capture the 3D structures that you, you see. Um, equations, they're, they're quadratic equations that, that capture the assumption that you're looking at a rigid object that's rotating rigidly in three-dimensional space. So, so in this case, we can actually build a computer vision system that has, in, in, in fact, all the cases that I've been talking about, we can build computer vision systems that hallucinate um, in ways that are very similar to how your visual system hallucinates. Hallucinates the shapes, the colors, the motions, the depths, and, and so forth. And in fact, um, what I'm basically showing you are the problems that we have to solve to build computer vision systems that can drive intelligent cars, right? So, so for cars that that are going to be um, autonomous and use um, at least passive visual vision systems, I know some some cars are using um, active. You know, they're using various kinds of um, active kinds of imaging. But those that are just taking passive video images and using that to guide you will have to be able to take all the video that's coming in through the video cameras, um, which is just a, a bunch of pixels. Um, you know, bunch, you know, a big array of numbers, millions of numbers, and you have to then interpret that in terms of saying, "Oh, that's a boy on a bicycle in the crosswalk. I need to stop." So, I mean, but you don't see that in the original image. You have to actually construct that that interpretation. So, one reason why, um, you know, the promise of self-driving cars um, that we thought would would happen fairly quickly hasn't happened yet, is because this problem of how we actually construct the 3D world and do it do it in a way that's even though it's not true it's 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 a useful guide to our behavior that's not a trivial problem um i started working on this back in 1979 so we've been at it for quite a while <laughs> and it's 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 not it's not trivial and then there were people that were doing it um uh, well before me uh you know so so we've been working on this vision problem for for many many years we're we're cracking it uh but there are literally a, a, roughly a third of your brain's cortex is involved in vision. A third of your highest processing power is correlated with visual processing. And you know, there's billions of neurons, you know, and probably maybe 20 billion neurons, roughly on, on the order of 20 billion neurons, maybe 30, 20 to 30 billion neurons. <clears throat> um, trillions of synapses are involved in just opening your eyes and looking at the world around you. And the reason is you're not just taking a picture of reality, you're getting a bunch of um, pixels and you got to figure out what 3D world corresponds to those pixels. And that's that's not trivial. And that's why self-driving cars um, are still not, um, they'll, they will eventually make it uh, and they'll be safe, but um, it's not trivial to do. Um, this is the direction that you see this the dancer spinning. Some of you may see her spinning. Um, if you look, if you're looking down from the top, she might be look, looking like she's spinning clockwise or, or counterclockwise. But if you if you look at her and then look away, she will change. Sometimes she will change the direction in which she's spinning. Hmm. So if you so. So if you look at her for long enough, she'll she she may change direction. I'll I'll just give you a second to 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 look, and you might try looking away and looking back at her. Um, when she changes direction, though, nothing changed in the video at all. That's entirely you. You you are assigning. There is no such thing as the true direction of her spin. Whatever direction you assign to her is arbitrary, and you're you're making up that direction of spin. Again, this is not me. So I, I take credit for none of these images or ideas except for the one with those bands that were going across. So just to, just to be clear, I'm not taking any credit for any of these. And I'm not taking credit for this one, but here you might see, this is uh, Gunnar Johansson and his colleagues uh, from Sweden, I believe. Um, in these examples, there's just a bunch of dots moving, but you probably see, here's a person walking, here's someone throwing a ball, here's someone doing jumping jacks. Here, you know, you can just see um, what we call biological motion. And so here is just a few dots, but we're actually giving it an, an interpretation of a human figure doing various kinds of activities. Um, and this was actually, uh, Gunnar Johansson was the psychologist who studied this, but this was actually first done 
um, by um, the Black Light Theater in Prague in the 1960s. So this was actually, they had dancers in, in the theater. They would turn out the lights in the theater and the dancers were like black leotards, but they would have these um, patches on the, on the joints, like the elbow and the shoulder and the wrist and knee and so forth that would reflect um, a black light. And so the, all when the dancers came on stage, all you would see were these little patches on their joints. And, but you could see what the dancers were doing. So that was, it was a, a nice the, the, theatrical kind of production. Um, so I was gonna change gears, but uh, maybe I should stop now and, and see if there are, are questions about this. Um, I can tell you at the top level what I was thinking about doing. I, this first part was just about visual intelligence, how we create what we see. And of course, that's quite relevant to architecture because in some sense, people are looking at architecture and, and once you understand the rules of human vision and how they work, you can you can start to play with architecture in new ways. You can create yeah. whatever you want people to see. Once you know these rules, you can, in your architecture, purposely design patterns that will give the, the illusions of depth and shape and color and motion, whatever it is you want. Um, once you understand these rules, you can, the, the implications for architecture are endless. Um, and I think that they've not been exploited. I think that very, very few people even understand that you're not seeing the truth, you're constructing it and, and there are rules of construction. So, so if yeah. there are questions now, we can talk about this part and then I can move on to some other things. Well, this already appears to be more fun than a lot of the podcasts that I've seen you in because we're getting all this, all these visual information from you. <laughs> this, is, this is great. Um, well, one of the things that I wanted to ask that I was thinking about when you, uh, when you uh, were presenting some of the images before, is there, um, we all assume this kind of Cartesian idea that, you know, I think, I think therefore I am, except there seems to be an, there is a kind of linear agreement i would argue that you that you have to assume when you're when you are you are um, showing these examples that we all are uh misinterpret or read or interpret uh sets of images in the same way so there's a, there's a certain uh consensus in your field that there's something going on in the human brain that is that that is connected almost uh Maybe it's a hive mind of a sort, where there are there are there is a linear level of perception that that is consistent, even though those illusions are are demonstrating that that we uh, are 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 uh, are not seeing things as they are. I don't know if that's a clue. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, a, a good good point, David. Um, what we find is that. Yes, the, the way I've talked about it so far is to say that everybody sees the same kind of thing. But when we actually do more careful experiments, we find that there are individual differences that, that can be substantial in, in, in some cases. So, uh, and I'll, I'll give maybe one of the more spectacular uh, examples of this. It's called synesthesia. So there are some people called, who are synesthetes and and there are many kind, many kinds of synesthesia. So one kind would be that, uh, for example, my friend Carol Steen, uh, everything that she hears, so all the auditory information that she hears, music and so forth, she also has a, she sees a visual shape with a definite three-dimensional structure to it and a definite coloring to its surface and a definite motion. And as the music proceeds, that shape and its surface properties are changing dynamically. And every time she hears the same piece of music, she sees exactly the same three-dimensional shape with the same color. So it, it's, 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 it's not haphazard. So now most of us don't see that. <laughs> At least I, I don't see that. <laughs> but it turns out that there are many kinds of synesthesia. Um, that, that's one of the more spectacular kinds. Uh, a guy named Michael Watson, everything that he tasted with his tongue, he felt as a three-dimensional shape with his hands. So when he tasted mint, he felt 
tall, cold, very, very smooth columns of glass, almost like they were ice or something like that. And Angostura bitters, it felt like um, some kind of spongy things that he put his fingers in, um, like an ivy or something like that. Um, ivy leaves. So every taste had a three-dimensional shape that he could feel with his hands. And, and so what we, so when we talk about, you know, how vision works, we can say that there is some broad agreement across the majority of people, um, even among non-synesthetes though, there are differences and measurable differences that are systematic. And then when you get to synesthesia, you have um, people who are, are just dramatically different from from what we take the rest of us to be. So from an evolutionary point of view, and you know, my, my attitude is that evolution by natural selection is the best theory that science has right now about biological evolution inside space and time. It's there there are no no competitors worth talking about right now um, with uh, in terms of a biological evolution model of, of why we have the visual systems and other sensory systems that we have. Later on, I can talk about why I think evolutionary theory is not deeply true, um, but but inside space and time, it's the best model that we have. And it's and that model really, so evolution by natural selection uh, makes it very, very clear that um, from that point of view, our sensory systems have evolved to guide adaptive behavior, not to show us the truth. And they've evolved to give us the information we need to act in ways that will help us survive long enough to reproduce. Uh, so, and that's that process is changing all the time. We're we're we're, we're not the the final products of evolution. We are in the process of evolution, and so it's no surprise that there's going to be the normal variation and selection that that goes on with evolution for humans. So, the from an evolutionary point of view, you would expect that there might be some broad consensus, but there'd be lots of little individual differences because those are the mutations that evolution is gonna be playing with to see what oh, might wow. be better in the next generation, right? right. So, so, that's, so again, I'm not saying that evolution by natural selection is the final word or it's the deep truth, but we have no better scientific model now. And I think as a scientist, that's the, 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 the level of deep respect we should have for the model. It's the best we've got right now but also the, the level of skepticism that's appropriate to science. We can do better. Let's, let's find a deeper model, right? So, so anyway. That's so beautifully said though, because the, uh, if I understand the way you're arguing it, 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 the nuances that are the different perceptions in individual human beings, but, but for argument's sake, even culturally, there are different ways of perceiving color. There are different, you know, there's environmental characteristics as well. But all these, all these different things are, um, in a sense, uh, as subtle as as the different components that allowed uh, survival of the fittest to to succeed uh, in terms of evolutionary, uh, you know, outcomes. So, so there are subtle differences in the way humans see. Are, and again, arguably even subtle differences in the way culture, uh, different cultural milieus can see, and that that is that that could describe the differences in the in some of these some of these tests or the nuances in, in tests or even the nuances in the way different uh, synesthesia works in different people. A absolutely. In, in fact, I, I would I agree with everything you said, David. And I would say this: if it if we had discovered that everybody had visual systems that worked exactly the same way, no exceptions, same rules, then I would take that as a um, disproof of evolution by natural selection. That would be an empirical disproof of, of, of evolution. So, right. so the fact that we have these variations, even the big ones like synesth synesthesia kind of variations is um, exactly what you would predict from a theory of evolution by natural selection. And again, I wanna be very, very clear. I'm not saying that any scientific theory is true, including my own theories. I don't think we should say our scientific theories are true or the theory of everything. They're just the best theories that we have so far, and we should treat them with respect because they're the best we have so far. And we should also be looking to overthrow them as quickly as possible with better theories. That's that's the scientific attitude toward any scientific theory. So um, 
one step at a time. Any questions from any of the any yeah, of you guys? I, I have a long question. <laughs> That's um, uh, Ian Matthews, hey, hey, one of my students. Professor, <laughs> Professor Hoffman, um, when you say colors are an invention, um, what do you mean? Are, are they not a byproduct, maybe, of higher order evolution? Well, if you asked a physicist about color and, and said, what properties in the world are colors? They would say that in our standard model of physics, we have bosons, leptons, and quarks, and they have properties like mass, spin, charge, momentum, and so forth. But color is not one of them. You know, not you know, red RGB kinds of colors are not any properties. Now, what we as human beings experience as color is correlated with frequencies of photons, right? So the frequencies of, 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 of or, or wavelengths of photons are correlated with our color experience. But by the way, the, 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 the correlation is not perfect, but, but photons have no color. If you asked a physicist, so what, what's the color of a photon? They would say that you, you're not talking physics, that there is no such thing as the color of a photon. Photons have um, um, zero mass, they have spin one, and they have frequency or wavelengths. Um, and they, may, they have helicity, but, but they don't have color. The, that's just not there. So color is entirely a fiction. From a physicist's point of view, color is a useful fiction that our, our, our visual systems create. Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, so, you know, one of the, one of the ways that I introduced your work to the, to the class was, uh, and we're actually probably the next part of your lecture is going to start going there, but it, it's in terms of this, uh, huge, uh, spectrum of, of thinkers that are now talking about virtual reality. I, th I think, um, You've probably been in a podcast with Bernardo Castrum at this point. Yes, I have. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're good friends. And um, also uh, Nick Bostrom. I don't know if you've interacted. I've met him. Yeah, we haven't done a post. We haven't done a podcast, but I met him at a TED conference. <laughs> yeah, and we had a we had a lecture a few weeks ago here from uh, some folks from uh, Zaha Hadid Architects, who are uh, one of the major firms in the world, and. Um, they are um, creating um, virtual cities now, um, you know, completely uh, computer um, bounded environments where you can go in and interact with other people. And the goal and the goal truly is to get um, far past video game reality where you are in an avatar and you can, enter, you know, this has been an experiment ongoing now with uh, computers for years and years. And so, um, your your work in um in what probably what you're going to be talking about a little bit in the next part of the lecture um has been fascinating in terms of what uh where architects are going and what we're seeing in Hollywood even with CGI and and uh absolutely you've spoken about video games and the and the metaphors you use in terms of the headset and um it, to me it seems to be opening up almost infinite possibilities with architecture, far beyond even just playing with visual illusions um, in terms of what architecture is capable of. And the other thing that I've spoken about with the students, which you're, you, you alluded to a second ago, is that as, as I've uh, tried to understand um, physics more and how we see, it appears, and this is Bernard, Bernard Alcastrum territory for argument's sake, where um, we, we're beginning to see that consciousness is irreducible not materialism and architects architects of course are fixated on and you could argue are fixated on materialism and so it's a wonderful flip to to begin to see our own profession as not having materialism at its, at its base and in some way that seems almost fully empowering to be able to take that on that that at the root of the most concrete of professions you're dealing with um, consciousness. You're dealing with the imagination, purely imagination. Absolutely, and that's that's where I plan to go next in the next, next few slides. <clears throat> um, I, I would say that one reason why I talked about these visual illusions early on uh, in in the talk, and that you know I don't usually do that in my other podcasts, <clears throat> is that 
to understand the, the mathematically precise rules by which human vision constructs colors, shapes, motions, and objects is absolutely essential for successful virtual reality. Unless you understand how the software in the brain works. So yet, so the, there's 20, 30 billion neurons you know, that we say are, are involved in this and so forth. And there are these rules. I, I mentioned a few of the rules, like you know, put light sources overhead, try to construct convex things, use rigidity to construct 3D objects from motion. There are, there, there are dozens and dozens of these mathematically precise rules. And that is the foundation for any successful virtual reality. So the VR companies have to have visual scientists who know this stuff to, to make the VR headsets even work. Um, otherwise they just wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to us. So, so understanding those rules is, is, is critical, not only for VR success, but also I think for architecture to actually understand in a deep way how your architecture is going to impact human vision and, and what people will see and why they will see that. I'll just give you a concrete example. I, um, how this plays out in a practical situation like architecture. I, I was hired by um, some major jeans companies um, to help them sell jeans. And what I pointed out to them was, remember I showed you that the, the image back here, we'll go back here, um, the shaded bumps. Maybe I went past it. No, that, that takes a while. Let me show you those shaded bumps. There we go. Those bumps. <clears throat> Notice that the pattern of shading creates a three-dimensional shape. And what I pointed out to these jeans manufacturers is they were they were creating distressed jeans. They would artificially, you know, distress the jeans. So they would have these nice blue jeans, but there'd be light patches on them. And but they didn't understand this what's being shown here, that we take those changes from like dark blue to light blue, and we're creating a three-dimensional shape. And so I pointed out to them that what they were doing with the way that they were doing is they were giving everybody what we call pancake butt. <laughs> everybody had flat butts. Now, maybe, maybe you would like to have a flat butt in your jeans, but most people don't. Most people would like to have a, a more pleasant look. And so I, so what I did was I showed them how to systematically change the how they distress their genes so that the and, and also how to change this the structure so the way that the pockets are outlined and all the details all of it is telling a story um right so there's no line on your gene or any art piece of apparel that's not telling a story that that your visual system is going to use to construct a 3D shape. So, so you are, so what I told them was, look, when you create genes with distress and you put um, the, the so shading gradient on the genes, and then you have pockets with certain shapes and certain stitchings and so forth, you are telling a 3D story. Whether you know it or not, you are telling a 3D story. You cannot help it. it, it it's, it's not optional. You will tell a 3D story to the visual system. So the question is, the only question is, are you doing it intelligently? Do you know what story you're telling and are you doing it on purpose or is it all accident? And it's just, and it was all accident. So then I showed them how to do it on purpose. And what we did was we created these genes where you could, if you want to look any way you want, I could show you how to make it. So we could make you look more curvy, whatever you, if you want to look flat, um, we can do that if you want, but at least we're doing it on purpose. And so the same thing now I would say is true about architecture. When you're so the point I was making with the jeans companies, and, and, and by the way, they made tons of money <laughs> on these jeans because people <laughs> love them. They they were and we, we even had these um in my book, um, The Case Against Reality, I have a picture of a woman in one of these jeans, so, uh, so a shot of her, and you can see the picture in my book. On the left side is the old way, where it sort of gives you pancake butt, <laughs> and on the right side was the new way. And you could just see she looks like a different person. So it's one woman in the genes. On the left side, she looks one way, and on the right side, she looks entirely different. And so, and and it's the same woman. So it's entirely um, what you are priming the visual system to construct. So the same thing is going to be true, as you can see, about architecture. 
Anytime you put any kind of colors or shading gradients or structures or any kind of features, you are telling a story to the visual system. The only question is, do you understand the stories that you're telling and are you telling them on purpose? And now you may understand a few of the rules. And so you may be understand part of the story that you're telling, but unless you understand. So in other words, I'm saying in some sense for, for, for the most successful and deeply powerful and inventive architecture, it's essential to know the rules of how visual systems create depths and shapes. Um, it's, it's absolutely incredible, it, it, important for the same thing as it, it, as I mentioned in virtual reality. You, you have to know the rules, or v, VR would not even be possible. So that's the the sense in which um, I think that this. Uh, but now I'll, I'll go to the stuff that you were talking about, David. The you know the fact that um, what we take to be reality is. Um, the physicist. One, one, one more quick point, Don. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I had mentioned to you when I first started speaking with you that architects um, in general, whether they're educated this way or not, if you're trying to kind of work at the limits of the profession, are interested in uh, maybe arguably like a lot of artists, but certainly you could talk about architects this way about in terms of the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. And when you look at architectural history with that in mind, you start to see a specific line. And the, and the line does seem to follow, it, it is this idea of architects trying to be open and to mimic the other professions, you know, the mm -hmm. other sciences. And so, um, you know, Zaha Hadid's work is very fluid and it's actually pushing structural engineering and it's it's pushing a lot of things. Some of Frank Lloyd Wright's latest work, like the Guggenheim Museum in New York, is a very fluid line, which seemed to describe you know Einsteinian uh, physics again. So I, I I think there there is a component of architecture that that I don't know was necessarily fixated on on uh, the visual. Certainly, architects are obsessed with light, with bending light, and how light hits form. But there's something else in the profession that has to do with trying, I think, I, honestly, I think it's trying to mimic what is happening in physics, trying to get, get that, in, you know, the limits of science, as it were. And once again, that ties, that, that's part of the fascination I've had with your work. So, Yeah, that, no, I, I agree. And, and we even see that like it, with artists, that there are these social influences, that there are, there are periods in art where, so artists, many of them will have a deep intuitive understanding about how the visual system works because that's what they're doing. They're actually tricking the visual system. But then you have these social, you know, the, the, we have the cubist period and then we have what other, other right. periods there might be. Um, and so, yeah, there, there'll be these social trends. But but every good artist, I mean, P Picasso could do very abstract things, but but he could also kill you with a real realistic image, right? He could actually, he he, he knew how to make something that was very, very photorealistic as well. Um, and and so I think a, a, a good architect will want to know all these rules so they could make whatever they have the flexibility to do whatever they want to your visual system, <laughs> <laughs> including good. being in the current uh, spirit of the times in terms of architectural spirit of, of what's cool to do right now <laughs> or to break the mold. Right. Um, right. And we can talk about breaking the mold in a, in a minute. So I'll talk a little bit then about um, reality. And what physicists are telling us. So, um, and and also about research and consciousness, um, and and what uh, my colleagues are, are thinking about in terms of consciousness and, and reality. So, so just briefly on consciousness, there are many many theories about conscious consciousness and how consciousness um, arises. Um, I've mentioned a few of them here, and they all assume that space and time are fundamental, and that particles in space and time are fundamental, and these particles. In, when they have the right kinds of complicated arrangements, they create brains and other complicated um, objects. And that, but brains with the right um, patterns of activity create our conscious experiences or the illusion of conscious experiences. So the way I would say 99% of my colleagues who are studying consciousness, all of them are, I would say 99% of them are physicalists. They assume that space and time are fundamental. Physical objects are fundamental. Consciousness is created by complicated systems like the brain or maybe artificial intelligences that have the right kinds of uh, 
uh, complication. Um, and panpsychists as well. So there are some panpsychists um, who would claim that space and time are fundamental, but that behind the fundamental particles of physics, there is also consciousness that sort of breathes fire into the equations of, of, of physics. Um, but high, high energy theoretical physicists, so that's a specific branch of physics, high energy theoretical physics. These are the theorists who are pushing the frontiers of physics uh, in terms of um, their understanding of space-time, right? They're using the highest energies, like they're the ones that are at the Large Hadron Collider looking at particles, you know, smashing particles together to study, you know, quarks and gluons inside protons and so forth. So these are the, this is their domain. It is the fundamental nature of space-time. And what these, many of these high-energy theoretical physicists are telling us now is that space-time is doomed. It's not fundamental. We've assumed since Newton, at least, that space and time or their combination into space-time is the fundamental nature of reality. And now those scientists whose turf this is are telling us it's over. You know, the experts on space-time are telling us it's over for space-time. It's not fundamental. And here's just a few quotes. Uh, Nathan Seiberg at, at Princeton Institute for, for Advanced Studies says, I'm almost certain that space and time are illusions. These are primitive notions that will be replaced by something more sophisticated. Andrew Strominger at Harvard, at Harvard says that the notion of space-time is clearly something we're going to have to give up. Uh, Nima Arkani Hamed at, at, at Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton says the very notion of space-time is not a fundamental one. Space-time is doomed. There is no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the actual underlying description of the laws of physics. And David Gross, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on, on quantum chromodynamics, uh, says there is no operational meaning to distances smaller than the Planck length. He's, he's explaining why space-time is doomed, that it basically, it ceases to have any meaning at, at small scales, the Planck length. That's 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So, yeah. No, yeah. Question. Question. If when we discovered that color is actually when we pull the headset back and we discovered that color is actually a manifestation of wavelengths, we never said color is doom. Why doom our current window of understanding or our current perception? Why use that type of language? Okay, so so when the physicists say space time is doomed. They're not saying it, that space time is not useful. They're yeah. saying if you're looking for a fundamental scientific theory, space time is not it. We thought it was it, but we were wrong. So is the, the same attitude with color. No one takes color to be the fundamental nature of reality. At least um, most physicists don't. Um, but but we, but in that case, most of us never proposed that color was a fundamental reality. But but physicists did think that physics. In, in physics, that space-time was the fundamental reality. And so in that sense, it's doomed. There's got to be a deeper, uh, mathematically precise structure that, that's entirely different from space-time. So that, 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 but I would be happy for you to push back if, you, if that's not a satisfactory answer. Well, I still hope it's turtles all the way down though. <laughs> it's like e even Arkani Hamed behind, behind what he's, what he is, working on you know which is some some type of flat geometry you know wh whatever whatever that is and i've heard other i've heard other uh, mathematicians and and uh, philosophers talk about it as well i mean it's fascinating to to and and also one in that sense we are we are inside a projection in this sense right that, that that's right so yeah. it, it, basically what they're saying is that um our perception of the universe in terms of space and time is not deeply true it's it's it, it it's a useful tool down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters now notice that 10 to the minus 33 centimeters not 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters just 10 to the minus 33 the whole thing falls apart so it's a fairly it think of it as a a data structure, and it's a fairly shallow data structure. It's fairly trivial. 
and it only has three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. It's, it's. I think of it as a VR headset, and, and we got a cheap model. So space time is a sort of a cheap model headset, a VR headset, and the physicists are, are realizing that the, the high energy theoretical physicists realizing, okay, well, we thought space and time is fundamental. It's doomed for being fundamental. It's not doomed for being useful. It's perfectly useful. We, we, we use space and time all the time. But for us as theorists looking for a deep understanding of the nature of reality, space time is not it. And so in that sense, space time is doomed. And But now, as, as David mentioned, they're in the last 10 years, they have gone beyond space time. So this is all new. But they found new structures, mathematical structures beyond space time that allow them to make empirically testable predictions inside space time, for example, about scattering processes at the Large Hadron Collider. And they make successful predictions about those scattering processes. And in fact, they beat, in many cases, they beat the predictions you can make inside space time in, in the following way. For, for scattering processes like two gluons go into each other and four gluons go spraying out. If you do it inside space time using Feynman diagrams and, and quantum field theory, it's hundreds of pages of algebra, millions of terms. Right. If you do it with the new structures that have just been published in the last 10 years that are entirely outside of space time, and I should be clear, these are not like little things curled up inside small dimensions of space time that you can't see. We're letting go of space-time altogether. We don't need space-time. These are beyond, entirely outside of space-time. So think of, of space-time as a headset. And physicists are saying, we're taking the headset off and we're looking at, at what's behind the headset. Okay. So these new structures are behind the headset, something called the amplitudehedron, decorated permutations, and they make mathematically precise predictions of these scattering amplitudes. And, but what was millions of terms inside space-time can be done in many cases in four or five terms that you can write by hand and compute by hand. So all of a sudden the math, when you let go of space-time and go outside of space-time, the math becomes simpler and you get the right answer. And moreover, they find new symmetries that are true of the data, of the scattering data, but cannot be captured inside space-time. So space-time is our headset. It's not the truth. When we let go of the headset and go to a deeper level of reality, all of a sudden the math becomes much easier and we see new symmetries that are true that we couldn't see with our cheap headset. So the race is on now. These high energy theoretical physicists are quite excited and, and they just there's a new $10 million, 10 million euro grant for the, what they call positive geometry research. This is, positive geometries are like, like the key structures that they're finding outside of space time. So just in the last few weeks, big money pouring in because the race is on for what's beyond space time. So space time is doomed, but the money is going into what's beyond space time um, and, the, and the race is on. And, and I was I was getting, it, it, it all sounds like architects are gonna win it in the end. <laughs> In, the, no, in terms of geometry being outside space time, when I've, when I've uh, listened to a lot of these guys, it's like, oh, you know, it's uh, maybe, maybe the architects can uh, can help in there. In in terms of something yeah. something being two, it's almost like an architectural floor plan, two dimensional, no other dimension, you know, no other dimensions but lines and points. This is how I I uh, I've heard uh, numerous. Uh, uh, you know, thought leaders talk talk this way about what might be outside this uh, system that we're in. That, that's right. Well, it's we're at a very interesting point in the history of of physics because the, you know this the younger generation that makes the next the next exploration right. It's the older generation has to die <laughs> with their <laughs> theories, but but yeah. the young guys and young female theoretical physicists were were doing this interesting work. They're finding these what sort of called a class of positive geometries. That seems to be one of the big things, these positive geometries. And, and then the other structures like decorated permutations to sort of classify these geometries and get their, their deep invariant properties. And, and so they're, but, but these are like static structures. There's no notion of, typically physics is about change, about dynamics. So, there's no, so this is an interesting position. So they've taken the headset off, 
they're looking for what do we find outside of the space-time headset? We're finding these positive geometries and decorated permutations, amplitudehedra, you know, cosmological polytopes, th those kind of things. But they haven't found a dynamics yet. So, and that's going to be interesting because this will be a dynamics of entities that are entirely outside of space-time. So, you know, this is this is outer limits kind of stuff. This is these are entities not inside space-time. They're outside of space-time that have a dynamics. So, so what kind of entities are these? And what what are they up to? What what dynamics do they have and why? And why does it look like these positive geometries that we're seeing? So we're right in, it's the, it's the wild, it's not the wild west, it's the wild outdoors. And we're, out, we're outdoors of the headset now. And we're, we're looking to to see what's out there. And so it's, it's, it's tr tremendous fun. Um, so I'll, I'll just go on and explain what David Gross was saying here when he says there's no operational meaning to distances smaller than the Planck scale. Um, wh why are the physicists saying space-time is doomed? Well, the, here's the issue. If you want to look at smaller and smaller things, you need more and more powerful microscopes. And those, what, what do those microscopes do? They are using light with smaller and smaller wavelengths to resolve the structure that you're looking at. If the wavelength is too fat, you won't be able to resolve the structure of what you're looking at, right? So you need skinny wavelengths to resolve tiny things. Um, and, and that's fine. Um, quantum mechanics allows you to, to do that. You can make the, the wavelengths as small as you want. But when you bring quantum mechanics and Einstein's gravity, his theory of gravity together, Einstein tells us that Actually, Einstein told us that E equals H nu, so that energy and frequency of the light are the same thing. He also told us that energy and mass are the same thing. So what, what, what Einstein told us is that as the wavelength of the light gets smaller, the effective mass that's associated with it is getting higher. And so as you go to smaller and smaller wavelengths, you're concentrating more and more mass into such a small region of space that eventually you create a black hole. You actually destroy the very object, like the electron or, or a proton, whatever it is you're trying to look at, you destroy the very thing that you're trying to investigate. So the smallest, and, the smallest thing will not allow itself to be measured. Well, space that, that's space right. collapses itself. The, 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 the space itself throws up its hands and, and says, I give up at 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And, 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 and again, it, from my point of view, that's 10 to the minus 33, not 10 to the minus 33 trillion, just 10 to the minus 33. So this thing is a shallow, shallow data structure, throws up its hands really, really quickly. And I, I imagine that within a couple centuries, our technology will be knocking on that door and we'll be going, okay, well, we're now, we can now probe at that link and now space-time literally falls apart. We're not there yet right now, but hey, we we just over a century ago, we were, we were we only had pea shooters compared to our current colliders. Um, so, so in a couple of centuries, we'll be knocking on that door and, and the limits of space time will be right in our face. And the 10 to the minus 33, as opposed to 10 to the minus 33 trillion will be a, a serious barrier. So, so that's why space time is doomed. And by the way, um, it's not just space time, but it's also quantum theory. Um, quantum theory uh, uh, cannot be fundamental. It, it has to arise as well uh, many you know, high energy theoretical physicists say that quantum theory has to arise with space time together. Um, the new structures that, for example, Nima or Connie Hamed at, at Princeton has found um, don't have any so called Hilbert spaces in them. So there, there are no Hilbert spaces, there's no quantum mechanics. But he shows yeah. how space time and quantum mechanics arise together as simple projections of this much deeper structure. So it's the space-time and quantum theory that are both doomed as being fundamental theories. Professor Hoffman? Yes. Um, are, is uh, is uh, chemistry doomed because it can't predict protein folding? And is gravity doomed because it can't predict the three-body problem? Well, so chemistry the with chemistry um we have just in pr uh, practical problems right the thing is so complicated 
that, you know, and the rules of quantum mechanics are so complicated that it's hard for us to predict, um, you know, lots of you know, complex chemical interactions. So, but ultimately, that wouldn't be the reason why you would want to say that chemistry is problematic. I mean, the fact that it's it's complicated. We're, we're now building AIs, for example, that are able to, to help us in, in understanding how chemistry can work in complicated situations. But that's and, not physical. I'm, I'm sorry? That, those AI models are not a physical model. They're not modeling physical reality. They're modeling... It's like next word algorithms, but next then algorithms. Right. That, that's right. So, so there you... You're, just when a AI learns something, it's not really clear how they've learned it, right? You'd have to actually go inside all the deep data structures that they evolve to understand what it is. And, and that, that's actually an interesting open issue in, in, in many AI projects is, so the, the, the system is working. Um, what did it learn? How do I know? Well, look, you have to go inside <laughs> all this code to figure out what 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 is it that it really learned. It's giving us good answers and it's giving us all sorts of insights, but we have no idea what you know what kind of knowledge structures that is built. But now, so ultimately, when we say that that space time is doomed, as in, in terms of being all that they're saying is, if you're looking for a fundamental theory of everything, space time cannot be it. So if you're looking for the theory of everything, it will not include the idea of space-time. Space-time, yeah. Okay. Now, now it turns out that chemistry is something inside space-time. Right. So, so ultimately, chemistry and gravity are doomed because space-time is doomed. So yeah. everything that we know and love inside space-time. Um, from a from a theoretical physics point of view, cannot be the fundamental nature of science, and we and for science to progress, um, we we cannot cling to space time or things inside space time. We've got to step outside, and when we do, we're rewarded. We find new deeper structures that do the scattering amplitudes much more easily and give us new symmetries that we didn't know before. So we're we're being patted on the back and told, "Hey, this is you're you're making a good move. You're you're discovering something outside space time." Um, well, so I, I think you've said this too, though. I mean, ultimately, there, you know, there is no true theory of everything. It's infinite. Right. The search will be will be infinite. And but moving past the limitations or the the fears of ten to the minus thirty three, we're you know moving moving past it somehow will only open up new doors. I, and I'm very comfortable with that personally. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad, I, I, you know, there's a there's something in the, in the human brain that just, that is continually pushing and continually asking questions. And we're at a very unique time that you're, you're, you're one of the people documenting it where, where we can uh, potentially move past, uh, you know, the, Theory of space time and the and Einsteinian uh, theories, and and I wanted to say one more thing though. Just I think we're we're on the same page. But if you take a look, what, what I was mentioning the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. Have you been in it, by the way? Have you yes. had a chance? Yeah. So um, that has that particular. You know, he did that as an architect. That idea came from doing a parking ramp. He had a commission to do a. Uh, a parking structure in Pittsburgh, and then then that was canceled, and he got an opportunity to do the Guggenheim Museum, and so it's this idea of an infinite loop that just go keeps going. It's it's actually asymmetric. It starts it's kind of a cone shape, and the ramp just spins out into infinity, and it, and in many ways it's almost a, a concrete illustration of Einsteinian theory of like the expansion of the universe. So it became it, it. It was one of many reasons to measure Frank Lloyd Wright's magnificence that this man he figured this out in a in a way. Yes. And so when when you uh, when you think of going beyond space time, that's one of the as an architect that's fascinating to me in terms of how in the world you know what what kind of new spatial construction could possibly uh, you know be evocative. Of what Arkani Hamed is 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 uh, imagining, and so so uh, you know, does the philosopher come first? Does the scientist come first? Does the artist come first? I'm not so sure. I don't know. You know, I think I think that sometimes the innocence of the artist is you know, cubism 
Was it aligned with Einstein? Did Picasso talk to Einstein and then interpret Einstein? I'm, I don't think so. I think there was a lot happening that that created this new way of seeing people. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I agree with all the points you made there, and 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 I would also um, emphasize one of your earlier points that um, there is no theory of everything in science. So it's not just space time that's doomed. Um, any scientific theory is ultimately doomed. The next generation will replace it. And that's part of the glory of science is that we will never have a theory of everything. We will always have just the next, our next theory. And then the following generation will then find its limitations. If they, if they do their job, they'll find its limitations and go deeper. And so, so every, every specific scientific theory is doomed. It's none of them are going to be fundamental. Um, and so there is infinite job security in science and, and infinite creativity possibilities in architecture as a result. <laughs> so, so in fact, there's nothing special about space-time being doomed. Space-time is just, um, the reason it's a big deal right now is it, was, it, it had our imagination in its grip. And it's hard for us to let go of space-time. It's got a particularly strong grip on our imagination. And for most of us, it's it, it's almost like a personal offense to, to think of space-time as not being fundamental because that's something I deeply believed. How could I be so deeply wrong? But ultimately, the lesson of science is that all of our theories are trivial compared to whatever reality might be. But, but we go from one theory to another, um, probing different aspects, different perspectives on reality. And that's, that's the best science can do. And that gives us infinite possibilities for perspectives in architecture as well. So I'll turn to briefly um, an evolutionary argument as well that we don't see the truth. So I mean, you might say, well, the physicists are telling us that you know, we're, we're seeing the world in terms of space and time, and that's not true. But but surely evolution, I mean, we we've evolved to see objects in space and time. That's how that, we evolved, according to Darwin, to, to do that. And surely we evolved to see the truth. And so most of us think that you know if, if, if you know, evolution shapes sensory systems to keep us alive and the best way to keep us alive is to tell us the truth so so surely we see objects in space and time and um we've evolved to see the truth um <clears throat> but when you look at evolutionary theory more closely um as pinker does in his book how the mind works and and other books um and and as many theorists have done it 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 turns out that no um, evolution by natural selection, it, the purpose of evolution by natural selection is not to shape our sensory systems to show us the truth. It's, as Pinker says here, we evolve by natural selection to solve problems that were life and death matters to our ancestors, not to commune with correctness. In other words, evolution shapes our sensory systems to keep us alive long enough to raise kids. Period. That's what it's for. More technically, we say it, it, um, evolution shapes sensory systems to guide adaptive behavior. And that's what it does. Darwin's theory says sensory systems are shaped by evolution to guide adaptive behavior. We, want, we then like to add a little bit to Darwin's theory. And of course, the best way to do that, to, the best way to guide adaptive behavior is to show you the truth about reality. Well, no. As it turns out, absolutely not. For, for one thing, um, computing the truth, whatever that might mean, might take too much time. If I'm computing the truth and a tiger's about to get me, I may need to have some quick tricks and heuristics to just know that there's a tiger or, or know that something's about to happen, I need to move without knowing you know, the truth. So, so sometimes the truth is gonna to take too much computation and too much time. Um, and there are other, other arguments, but the, the real thing is you, you can ask a technical question, does I, uh, Darwin's theory of natural selection, does natural selection favor vertical perception? That is perceptions that are matched to the true state of the world, whatever that might mean. And um, so I and, and my collaborators, uh, mathematician Chaitan Prakash and, and uh, Brian Marion, Justin Mark, and, and several others that I, I work with. Um, but uh, ultimately the deep mathematics, I'll tip my hat to Chaitan Prakash, a long-term friend and mathematician that, that 
without whom I would have nothing. <laughs> so yeah. thanks to Chaitan. Um, we, we have several theorems that basically establish that um, the probability that any sensory system has ever been shaped by natural selection to see any aspect of reality as it is, is zero. Probability is zero. Just, and that's just just follows from Darwin's theory, um, using what's called evolutionary game theory as, as a mathematical instantiation of it. So if you take evolution by natural selection seriously and use evolutionary game theory, then you then you prove um, if if you have a mathematician with you, it's easy. If if you're me, it's not it's not easy. <laughs> but you can prove that um, um, the probability is zero that any of our senses give us any hint of truth about the nature of reality. They do keep us alive. That's what Darwin said they needed to do. They keep us alive long enough to reproduce on average, but they don't tell us the truth. So what are they doing? What they're doing is, is more like they're giving you like a desktop interface. So here's a little desktop interface from, from a Mac, right? One of my and, favorite places. <laughs> yeah, 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 one of my yeah, favorite places, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, Yosemite. Yeah. Half Dome in Yosemite. Um, and, you know, here you see, uh, you know, in the lower right corner, you see a blue rectangle for uh, you know, some folder or, or some paper you're writing or a book you're writing. But is the paper or the book blue and rectangular in the lower right-hand corner of your computer just because the, the icon there is blue and rectangular, lower right-hand corner of the screen? Of course not. I mean, anybody who thought that misunderstands the desktop. It's not there to show you the truth. It's there to hide the truth. You, you know, the truth is that there are diodes, in, in this metaphor, the truth is there are diodes and resistors and millions of voltages. And to, to write a paper, you have to toggle millions of voltages in a precise pattern, right? Now, if you had to do that with a, you know, a volt, voltage regulator or some, you know, whatever kind of hardware device, good luck. You, you would never, you know, you could never write a paper, no one would ever hear from you. So, so a user interface, like the desktop, lets you control a complex reality like the innards of a computer, without any knowledge of that reality. It hides the truth from you. And that's what allows you to be um, most uh, useful, right? It, it gives you the ability to control the reality without knowing what the reality is. And that's what evolution did. It, it hides reality and gives us a simple user interface or a virtual, you think about it in terms of virtual reality. It gives us a VR, so space-time, We've talked about it as a VR headset. That's that's what I suggest evolution is telling us. We evolved space-time as a VR headset to hide the truth because we don't need to know the truth. We just need to know what we need to do, know to play the game of life, to survive long enough to reproduce. So think about it, you know, like Grand Theft Auto, you know, VR um, Grand Theft Auto. You, you What you're doing with is interacting with a complicated computer and, and users around the world, what you see is just a steering wheel, a virtual steering wheel and a, a dashboard and, and a you know, gas pedal and so forth. But what you're doing again is toggling millions of voltages in a precise pattern. Now, someone could try to play Grand Theft Auto by toggling those voltages, but I bet I would win if I just used my steering wheel and my headset. Uh, so I, I don't see the truth and I can beat the person who sees the truth at the game. And that's sort of the evolutionary point of view on this. So. The early rules of vision that I started off talking about are mathematically precise. And in my book, Visual Intelligence, I actually talk about them informally, but then I actually give you the mathematics in, in some cases. I tell you exactly, and or I point to the papers that give you the exact mathematics. So we know with great precision how this VR headset works. We know how you create the shapes and the colors and the motions and the depths and so forth. We know, so this is all, all really understood in, in some great detail. Of course, there's more research to do, but what we understand already is a huge wealth of, of input to architecture. This is how right, architects are building stuff that we're going to perceive through our headset. So you have to understand how that headset works to understand how you're going to affect people. So that's that's what that's all about. Um, when when we communicate with other metrology, say at the Large Hadron Collider, or when we peer into uh, a functional uh, FNMR, uh, FNMR uh, nuclear magnetic resonance 
device. Is this another headset? Yes, um, absolutely. But the way that this goes along with what David and I were talking about a little bit earlier, that there is no scientific theory of everything. In some sense, every theory that we have will be a deeper headset. It's a different, a deeper framework. And there's no end to the frameworks that science will discover in principle. And, and, and the reason for that is due to the very nature of scientific theories. So what is a scientific theory? A scientific theory says, please, if you will grant me this handful of assumptions, then I will use those assumptions to explain all this wonderful stuff. And I'll do it with mathematical precision. But you have to grant me those assumptions. And now those assumptions are not explained by the theory. They're the assumptions of the theory. They're not explained. So those are, for the purposes of that theory, those are miracles. We just grant them. Now, you might say, well, that's no problem. I'll give you a deeper scientific theory that explains those assumptions. Right. Absolutely. That's what science should do. But notice that your new theory will have its assumptions. And those are the miracles for your new theory. And so every time, so every generation, what it will do is get rid of the miracles of the previous generation, come up with a deeper theory, but they will have their own new miracles. And yeah. so and that's what we mean by every scientific theory is ultimately doomed because its assumptions were miracles. And science wants to now replace those miracles with a new, new explanatory framework. So, so that's why there's infinite job security in science. In the headset you're using? <laughs> I'm sorry? Why I not? Is the headset theory doomed? Uh, like, as we, as we, or is it just an infinite, like once we find something smaller than the Higgs boson, and we add another layer to, or do we just add another layer to the headset? Yeah, well, I would say that the the VR headset metaphor is just a useful metaphor for where we are right now with our current technology and so forth. It's it's sort of the metaphor for the a good metaphor for this time to help us take the next step we need to take. you know, in getting to it. But as as we as our science evolves. I mean, before we used to think about um, simpler metaphors. We we used to think about um, the brain as in space time, you know, in Newtonian terms, and even before that, simpler terms. We we've had these various metaphors that are that, that have gotten more sophisticated as as our science has got more sophisticated and technology gets more sophisticated. So so yeah, ultimately the 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 VR headset metaphor will look quite dated and, and antiquated, but but right now it's a useful metaphor. So yeah, my metaphor is doomed too. My my my, my <laughs> headset <laughs> metaphor is, is doomed, absolutely. Sure, yeah. That's right. But, <laughs> so but point, is, isn't it, 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 yeah, back to my point, like why use the word doomed? It, isn't it a, a wonderful place that we're at right now? And isn't every, uh, aren't our ancestors, aren't, even even their shortcomings aren't they beautiful? Well, oh yeah. So, um, well, again, the word "doomed" is. Uh, I'm just quoting the theoretical physicists, the, namely David Gross and Nimar Khani Hamed, and so those. So I'm just quoting them. They're the ones that who are saying, you know, it's doomed. Um, and what what they meant was, we thought that space time was going to be the final and fundamental framework, and right. it, that that's what they meant by space time is doomed. Um, but but I so it's in that spirit that I'm just quoting them. But ultimately, I think that your attitude, I think, is a good, good one. That that instead of saying doomed, we should say um, we've discovered something new and important, and that's wonderful. So space time has has its scope, but it also has its limits. So what we we knew that every theory would had has a scope and limits, and it's a beautiful thing. And so so we shouldn't be putting down our theories. We should admire them for what they can do. And also be hard nosed about what they can't do, um, and and move on. So, so yeah. So it's not a pejorative. I wouldn't say it's a pejorative term. And and I agree with you that we shouldn't use a pejorative meaning to it. It's just doomed as as if we thought it was the fundamental reality. No, it's not. It's a wonderful framework, but it has its limits, as well as a scope. Now. This then leads to another point um, that's important in science, which is that's, that that um, reductionism is doomed. That is that as we, I think I might have a quote from, yeah. 
you know, Nima. So, so the entire reductionist paradigm that fundamentally physics is given by some, uh, my, I got the thing, the thing is covered up here, but anyway. Yeah, sorry. Um, I can I can move us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe. Is that good? I can't see it still, but but, but no. I could I could read it. You want me to read it? Uh, Go ahead. Move it. Uh, so the entire reductionist paradigm that fundamentally physics is given by some laws at the ultra most oh. microscope mi microscopic distance scales. And that somehow we just have to go there to see what's going on is ultimately false because of gravity. That's right. So we've and this idea of reductionism has been critical in science that we just need to look at smaller and smaller stuff. And as we look at smaller and smaller stuff, we'll find more and more fundamental stuff and more and more fundamental laws that govern that stuff. And this has been incredibly powerful. Right? We went from chemistry to atoms and now atoms to subatomic particles and we're finding all sorts of neat stuff but what Nima and these other high energy theoretical physicists are telling us is that whole wonderful party is coming to an end um, and it's coming to an end soon because you can't even go bent past 10 to the minus 33 centimeters so you, the reductionism stops right there so ultimately reductionism um, only appeared to be the path to the truth. It's it's an artifact of our headset that in somehow, in some sense that it, it seemed to work as far as it did. That's an artifact of our headset format. Ultimately, reductionism is not giving us a deep insight into the nature of reality outside the headset. <clears throat> and one one um, symptom of that is that if you are frustrated and you, you say, okay, I've, I've tried to measure something at the Planck scale and I, I made a black hole. Well, I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna try to get a smaller wavelength of light by pumping more energy in, what happens is the black hole just gets bigger and bigger. So in fact, you actually see reductionism in reverse. In reverse, as you use stronger and stronger, smaller and smaller wavelengths, what's happening is you're losing more and more space time. You're 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 just so it's reversal of the reductionism. So 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 and physicists are now beginning to really understand that reductionism is is dead. And that many of the problems that they're having with with physics. So, right, one of the big problems that physicists have is the cosmological constant problem. Right. So, most of the time we hear about they've made predictions to the you know tenth decimal place or whatever, and they're right about the you know the the some property of the electron or something like the spin or magnetic moment of the electron. But what about the uh, mass energy density of the vacuum? How, you know, how close does quantum field theory get you to the correct answer for the mass energy density of the vacuum? You might say, well, you know, maybe they're off by, you know, 1% or 2% or you know, maybe they maybe they don't have to 10 deaths. Well, it, it turns off, it turns out that they're off by, um, depending on who tells you, somewhere between a factor of 10 to the 60th or 10 to the 120th. That is, they're off by one followed by 60 zeros or 120 zeros or somewhere in between. That, that's how many power orders of magnitude they're off. So, so this idea that the, you know reductionism fails may be a big part of this whole mess, you know, the, of the cosmological constant problem. It's not talked about too much, but that's it's a big embarrassment in physics right now that we can't get the cosmological constant right. So reductionism has a long history. We used to think that earth, air, fire, and water were the fundamental <laughs> developments. Right. Yeah. Some, some Greeks, I guess. Uh, then we thought the periodic table of elements, you know, Mendeleev and brilliant work. That was the fundamental nature of reality in, in reductionist framework. And then um, now in the standard model of physics, it's some um, quarks, leptons, and bosons. And this is in, in the standard model. But um, what we're what we're seeing is that there, this whole framework is 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 not correct. I mean, it's it's useful step in science, we had to go through this, but ultimately reductionism is false. Uh, now, in terms of studies of consciousness, as I mentioned earlier, all theories of consciousness, um, I would say 99% of my colleagues and friends who are doing work on consciousness are reductionists. They're, they believe space-time is fundamental and that reductionism is true and that fundamental particles are the fundamental constituents of reality. 
complicated collections of those particles lead to more macroscopic objects like these um, pyramidal neurons in the brain. And you know, neurons and glial cells and other kinds of cells together form things like brains. And then brains with the right properties give rise to consciousness. And that's sort of the, the standard view of, of most of my friends and colleagues who are studying consciousness. And the problem is that that if space-time is just a headset, objects in space-time exist only when you perceive them, and they don't exist when you when you look away. So this is one of the I haven't brought made this point out, but this is. If, if you were starting to feel comfortable with what I've been saying, I'm about to make you very uncomfortable, because what I'm what I'm saying is the idea that space time is doomed, that is just a VR headset means the moon does not exist when it's not perceived. You your moon is exists when you perceive it because you're creating that moon in your headset. You render it. Um, um, when I look away, my moon is gone. You you might see a moon, and I'm. But it's, again, think about a VR headset. <clears throat> if you're playing Grand Theft Auto, and I look over and I see a red Ferrari to my right, I can ask my friend who's in China who's playing with me and ask, "Do you see the red Ferrari?" And he says, "Yeah." And I say, well, "I'm gonna look. <clears throat> I'll look away." For me, the red Ferrari that I saw is gone because there is no red Ferrari. It was just pixels in my headset, right? And then I saw a red Ferrari from those pixels. But there is no red Ferrari in the supercomputer. You can look in the supercomputer. There's no red Ferrari there. But my friend could say, "Well, I still see the red Ferrari, so it's still there." Well, no. He's just rendering his own red Ferrari from his headset, but there's no red Ferrari in reality. So when we look at the moon, you render your moon, I render mine. There is no such thing as the moon. We just have a, you know, what we render. So the same thing is true about these theories of consciousness. They assume that the brains, that neural activity in brains creates consciousness. And what, what I'm saying is, uh, well, that can't possibly be because neurons only exist when they're perceived. I have no neurons right now. I have no brain right now. If you looked, your headset would show you neurons and brains inside my head. But that's just because that's what your, your headset does. So <clears throat> neurons, strictly speaking, cause none of our behaviors and none of our conscious experiences. Now, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I do, I've been involved in fMRI and EEG studies of, of neural activity in the brain. It's an important thing to do. Um, so I, I do I do study cognitive neuroscience. That's my field. But strictly speaking, neurons don't even exist when they're not perceived. So what we're doing is we're studying, when we study neuroscience, we're studying the best that our headset can do. That's all our headset can do. It, it gives us neurons and brains. So neuroscience is going to be far more complicated than we thought. We, we, we see about you know, 86 billion neurons in the brain and roughly the same number of glial cells. Um, so and, and then trillions of synapses. We're going. This is really, really complicated structure. Indeed, it is, and that's that's just what our headset is telling us. The real thing beyond space time is far more complicated. The headset is a dumbed down version. So neuroscience is going to be much, much more complicated. I see a neuron. And that doesn't mean that's because there really is a neuron. We're going to have to reverse engineer neurons. What is it outside of space time? What complicated dynamical systems beyond space-time project to the relatively trivial structure that we call a neuron inside space-time? So, so the whole framework that my colleagues are using to study consciousness is uh, doomed to fail because neurons don't even exist when they're not perceived. So neurons could not possibly be the source of our conscious experiences. So you can see how deep this, this, this thing goes. Yeah, I, I I think you've been, I think I've heard you speak about this as well in some in some of the podcasts that uh, that I've seen you in. But um, if you take this theory as far as it could go, for instance, that the Guggenheim right now doesn't exist. <laughs> There's uh, when I look at it, it exists. Um, I, I mentioned before though that there is some type of con of alignment of consciousness consciousness so that we all learn about the Guggenheim. And we're all aware that that Frank Lloyd Wright designed the Guggenheim. Um, the larger problematic aspect of this for me is like um, moral and ethical responsibility, politics, you know, all the all these kind of 
for argument's sake, surface things that are so important or else everything is chaos. And, and what, what is, what is making the, you know, the agreements that people, people use the word architecture, you know, it's one of these grand terms, the archi the architecture of the United States government, et cetera, this and that. And, um, our, and architects do want to make order of things. So again, it's a useful metaphor in that sense, but if, if, you know, what is, I, I, and I think I've heard Bernardo Castro apply um, ethics to this, you know, to, to, to this idea that e even though consciousness is the root of everything, there's a responsibility of one consciousness to another consciousness. And I think you've spoken about that too. Well, you, so great points and I'll respond to a couple. One is that, you know, this issue of things being some sense coordinated so that we, we you know, what is the coordinates are, are all of our experiences so that we tend to have agreements about them, right? If we go back to the, the VR metaphor, uh, you know, I'm playing with a bunch of people in multiplayer Grand Theft Auto, VR version of it. We might all agree that there's a red Porsche that's 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 beating me in the race right now. So we, we could all agree. But is there is there really a red Porsche anywhere? No. But there is in this metaphor, there's a supercomputer. And there are certain registers in the supercomputer that are that are you know computing the properties of this this Porsche and 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 so forth. And it's, so it's that supercomputer that's not red, it's not a Porsche. But there is some supercomputer that's that's causing the coordination, but it's outside of our VR headset, right? You, you can't see it inside. If you look anywhere that you can see in your VR headset, you can't see the coordination. It's outside of the VR headset. And so I think the same thing will be true here is that, yeah, there is some reality that allows the coordination of my experiences with yours. But that, re that, that reality is not inside space-time. It's utterly outside space-time. So, so the question then is, is what is what is the nature of that reality and what kind of moral implications does that have? Now, the first thing I should say is I don't know, right? I can speculate and I'm happy to speculate, but but I don't know. Here's here's the way I'm thinking about it right now. And this is where um what I'm doing with the scientific side seems to dovetail a, a bit with what some spiritual traditions have been saying for, for quite a while. So, so my approach is to say, first, there's a deep question here, which is, in this whole story, who am I? And what am I? How am I to understand myself? Well, first, science is telling us you cannot understand yourself as an object in space-time. Space-time is doomed. Well, how do I even think about myself as not inside space-time? What, and and so I, my my self conception is going to have to be radically changed because I thought I was a hundred and seventy pound object inside space time. That's what I yeah, that's what I thought. You know, so I, what is Don Hoffman? Well, he's 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 something that weighs about one hundred sixty five pounds. He's he's <laughs> he was born in such and such a year. He's going to die in such and such a time. He has a short little. So he's the what, what is Don Hoffman? He's a little tiny object inside space time. Trivial object. Space time's been around for 13.8 billion years. Hoffman's been around for a few decades. He's trivial, and he'll be gone. So I'm so that from that perspective, I and every everybody else on the planet are little trivial, ephemeral, here and gone specks of dust in this vast space time. But that whole framework is dead. Space time is doomed, and in fact, space time is just a headset. So I've got to the question of who am I has to be completely rethought from the from the ground up. I'm not a physical object in space-time, and I'm not a product of my neurons. My, my conscious experience of not a product. Neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. So who am I is the deep question that we have to ask ourselves, and ultimately science is going to have to ask itself. Uh, I, we all thought we were objects in space-time, and our best physics tells us that can't possibly be true. Just can't possibly yeah. be true. Uh, November. Yeah. Hi, November Terry. Hi, thanks for thanks for being here with us. Um, the whole time I'm not a scientist, and a lot of this stuff kind of goes over my head. But the one question that that's always in my mind is, um, uh, well, I just wrote down: Is seeing actually believing? Because 
for me, it, it's like a red Ferrari gives me an experience. It leaves an emotional footprint in my mind, in my consciousness. Now, just because I don't see it, does it cease to exist in my mind, in my consciousness? It does not, because now I have an emotional connection. I, I, have, a, I have a memory of it. And to me, it exists, right? Now, just because I don't see it, for me, it doesn't mean it's no longer there. Or the moon, for example. Um, I have an emotional experience with the moon, but I know it's there even if I don't see it. And this kind of, uh, we, we asked a question earlier before the class started for architects. Because our buildings are not going to last forever, is it better for us then to create buildings um, that's more interactive because when they disappear, they don't cease to exist because people who have been there remember how it made them feel. It's always going to exist in their consciousness, right? And I'm not sure where all of that fits in here, but for me, just because I can't see it doesn't mean it no longer exists. Right. So that's that's a, a really important point. And it gets to the fact that that we use the word real in two different senses. And so we should distinguish those two different senses. One sense of real is we say that something is real means that it would exist even if it was not perceived by anything. <clears throat> so something is real if it would exist even if it weren't perceived. That's one sense of real. So you might say, well, um, I think the moon exists even if no one ever perceived it. And so the moon is real in that sense. But there's another sense of real <clears throat> that we use. And that is to say, um, you might say, um, I have a really bad headache. So my, and my headache is real. Right. And and now notice I'm using the word real for that headache in a different sense. If I didn't experience the headache, it wouldn't exist. Right. So so I can't use the, the, the definition of real that says something is real if it exists, even if no one perceived it. Headaches don't exist in that sense. But they but if if you told me that my headache wasn't real, I would be very, very cross with you because I'm I'm having a bad headache. So, so there's another sense of real in which we say something is real if I'm having an experience, that it's real as an experience. And so, so what I'm saying is that there's the, there's the, what we call the objective sense of real, something exists even if it's there, even when no one perceives it, that's the objective sense. And then there's the subjective sense of real, which says it's real if it's a real experience being had by some observer. So some if, if some observer is having that experience, it's a real experience. And so what I, when I say that the space-time is a headset, what I'm saying is that the things that we thought were real in the objective sense are not. All that stuff is only real in the subjective sense. But that, that's fine with the point you're making. The architecture will, will have its impact, even though the objective reality doesn't exist, the subjective reality is, 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 will remain in the subjects. And so I agree with you. John, what about in a uh, Heisenberg uh metaphysical sense or like in a like um the, the uncertainty principle that once something is viewed uh it its state collapses um what about imagine a time before humans or before animals um and the moon is observed by the tides of the ocean the tides of the ocean just by feeling the gravity of the moon recognize the existence of the moon and therefore because everything and everyone is permanently interconnected there is never a time at which you aren't viewing the red ferrari there's never a time where the moon is not being viewed well so i like the idea that things are very deeply interconnected i think that that's probably there's some notion of truth that that's there um but the the tides on the earth and the the gravitational effects of the moon those are headset stories they're not the deep connection that you're talking about right the, so there so there is some deep connection but it's outside the headset we see that that connection inside the headset as what we call the gravity of the moon affecting the waves um and and, and on, on earth the waves of the oceans on earth so, so I, I like the idea that things are interconnected, but but that interconnectedness shouldn't be then taken to show that the moon is therefore objectively real and the tides are objectively real. No, those are just um, ephemeral projections 
that that are hinting at this deeper connection that's utterly outside space and time. But the moon only exists when it's perceived, and so do the tides. But the fact that those perceptions, those subjective experiences, are correlated is a pointer to this deeper connectivity outside of space and time. It's not a pointer to saying that, therefore, the gravity is real. No, the gravity is just a headset description. Something deeper is real, but it's nothing inside the headset. I hope that helps. <laughs> I, I, he nodded his head. So. Okay, I, I, <laughs> uh, Professor Craig on this one, I believe, but um, it's, it's, it's still a, a very fun and beautiful metaphor. Well, absolutely. Well, and I think the connectedness, there, there's a deep sense of, uh, in my own views, of, of that connectedness is, is a very, very deep principle. And it gets to this question of who am I that, that David, you know, that David's question prompted me to go after and that. So my own take is um, you and I are not anything inside the headset. We're something outside of space and time. No, it's so and, nice. Yeah. I love it's that. pretty interesting and 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 we're not ourselves the subject of any theory we're the authors of these scientific theories we are the understanding that is going to be involved in this endless process of creating i, I wanted to try i wanted to try one other question uh with you um one of the one of the ways that i I lecture um, about architecture and philosophy is that, and this is as I've learned more about Plato and Aristotle and the origins of philosophy, there seem to be um, two lines of evolution of this human condition. So on one line, you have the fact that, that we are talking to you through this magic, this technology, you know, and it's a mirror. This is like uh, when I was a kid, you know, the movie 2001, The Space Odyssey, that we're, we're living it. We're, I mean, here you are in the screen. It's, it's incredible. So technology and, and based on, on where uh, Arkani Hamed and going or, uh, is going and others, and you've, you've actually expounded on this too, we're, we, are, we are making magic. We're, we are conquering the miracles in every generation. And, and, and what we consider magic is, is uh, rote for the, you know, as we, as we move on. Just, you know, just like iPhones. This is better than Star Trek, these things. Right. So, right. But on the other hand, when I, when I read Plato and Aristotle and the ancient Greek philosophers, I'm not sure that the soul has evolved at all. And, and, um, and in some way, granted that there was misogyny and there's all sorts of issues that are in Plato's Republic that we that we don't want to agree with. But the basic essence of what constitutes ethics and morals, et cetera, appears to be consistent and does does not to, or or at the at the very best is evolving very, very slowly. That that could be an argument for some for an idea of consciousness, you know, outside the system, as it were. Right. But but I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that in relation to what your philosophies are. Well, no, I, I agree with what you said, David. And, and so I'll just put my my current thoughts right on the table. I, I think that um, consciousness is fundamental. And but the consciousness transcends any scientific description. We can get science can give us descriptions of projections of consciousness. And that's what science does, is it actually takes a projection of consciousness and gives a description of that projection. But you and I are that consciousness. In other words, what I'm suggesting is you're not just a little lump of matter inside space-time. You are something truly profound. You are, each one of us, is the infinite intelligence, the infinite consciousness that's choosing to put on a particular space-time headset and view itself through a particular little avatar, a David avatar, a Don avatar, whatever it might be. And it's and it's it's looking at itself. So the one consciousness is looking at itself through different avatars. So ultimately, the distinction between Don and David is, is not a real distinction. It's the one consciousness looking at itself through a Don avatar and a David avatar. And, and why is it doing that? Because 
in some sense, the way for the infinite intelligence to understand itself is to know what it's not, to look at itself from a particular perspective, throw itself in, all, all in, both feet, jump in with both feet on that particular perspective, look at itself from that point of view. So this little space-time headset, um, lose itself in that perspective, believe that it's just a little object in space-time, and then slowly wake up and realize its true nature and and realize what it is by realizing that this complicated thing that it thought it was, a little object in space-time, is not what it is. So it learns by negation. I'm not that. That was really interesting. That was really complicated. And as beautiful as that was, and as complicated as it is, I transcend even that. And so it's a matter of looking at itself from all these different perspectives and then transcending, transcending, transcending. And in that way, it knows itself. So that's my best guess. And, and, it, and in that case, ultimately, what is morals? The deepest foundation for morals would be to recognize not just it's not just like love your neighbor as yourself, as, as some religions say, but actually your neighbor is yourself, period. And that that is, so ultimately, the reason why we have moral failures is that the one consciousness chooses to allow itself to be asleep on purpose, to not know what it is, and to have the illusion that David and Don are different, and I need to compete with David or whatever it might be, right? So, so we have that illusion, but then to slowly wake up and realize, oh no, well, well I'm talking with David. I'm not talking with another. I'm talking to myself under a different guise, and I just have to wake up to that fact. And once we understand that, then morality just sort of comes along for the ride. Of course, I'm going to treat you properly because you are me. <laughs> it's it's beautiful. <laughs> that sounds like a theory of everything to me. <laughs> well, here, here's why it's not, David, because it's, it's, it's really critical. That I just told you is a story. And if there's anything true about it, it's, it's what it says we can't know. Now, you, you can truly say things that you can't know. So that, that you, but what, here's what we cannot know. And that is, what is a mathematical description of that one consciousness? And in my own mathematical theory of consciousness, so I have a mathematical theory of consciousness that I published, and you can see it's called the Fusions of Consciousness paper. I published it. It's an easy theorem from that theory that my mathematics cannot describe that ultimate one consciousness. It can only describe different projections of it. That's all I can do. Yeah, right. And so, so my own theory, what, what's, what's quote unquote true about my theory is my theory says, this is not a theory of everything. Yep, that's true. This is not a theory of everything. So it's true in that regard. And that's the only, in some sense, that's the deepest truth we can ever get is that. Now, how do you know the truth? You and I are the truth from this point of view. But any concept that we bring to bear is not it. It's only a perspective. So the only way to know the truth he is, as many spiritual traditions have said, let go of all concepts, sit in utter silence. Right. And then, and only then. So it, it's not, it's a sine qua non. To know the truth, it's a sine qua non to let go of, of concepts. Because you are the truth and you can only know yourself directly. Not e e ego death. <laughs> ego of, death. Right. right. So this is where science and spirituality seem to be dovetailing, finally. Um, <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to a rapprochement between science and spirituality. But I think both will be shocked by what they learn from the other, and both will be uh, helped by what they learn from the other. Uh, it's pretty much perfect timing because it's uh, it's two o'clock. <laughs> uh, do you do? Would you like? Do you have any concluding? Uh... So I'll just show a concluding slide. Um, I think ultimately these things will lead to concepts in architecture. Uh, and architecture, right? That once we understand that um, this is all a VR headset and we understand the rules of the headset, then we can start to play with the headset. And our, our architecture can be quite... Um, Quite, quite more flexible. Instead of having this framework of, of rigid things that exist, you know, in a physical world, we have this flexible world now. It's it's all VR. It's all being created on the fly. How can our architecture start to reflect that, the, the possibilities of that? 
Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's a pleasure. Yeah. Great pleasure. Okay. Um, I look forward to seeing the the video. Are you are you going to post it on YouTube or um? Um, you want me to send it to you first, or I'm happy. To, I can I can post. We could jump in the water and post it first. That's fine. Yeah, you can you, know? you can just post it. I, I I haven't said anything that I'm embarrassed about. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Same here. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, I, yeah. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Again. It's a Take pleasure. Care. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah.